here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host, Nina Mishra. My guest today is Christy Akulian, Head of iShares Investment Strategy, Americas at BlackRock. And uh, we're talking about the market outlook and uh, investing strategies for the second half of 2024. Christy, welcome back and congratulations. Uh, I just read that iShares has surpassed four trillion in assets under management. That's awesome. Great. Thanks so much for having me back, Nina. It's great to be here. And yeah, a pretty momentous week for us. Um, four trillion, I, I think our I think uh, Larry said we're going to be able to have a, a party to celebrate. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's talk about the market now. So the first half of 2024 was terrific for stocks, and that was mainly fueled by AI enthusiasm and uh, a resilient U.S. economy, improving corporate earnings, and also signs of cooling inflation. And now a lower than expected June CPI print that has driven a significant shift in the market because that has raised the odds for the Fed to start cutting rates in September. And uh, I saw your uh, BlackRock's macro outlook, and uh, that suggests a cautiously optimistic view of the U.S. economy with expectations of continued growth and then gradual easing of the monetary policy. So please tell us more about your macroeconomic outlook and uh, how many rate cuts do you expect this year? Yeah, so great, great starting point for this. Um, I, I think that your characterization is right there. Um, we do say, you know, in terms of thinking about this is cautiously optimistic, right? So we do we do talk about in our mid-year outlook that we, we just published last week um, that we are leaning into risk. Um, so we do still like staying invested. We are still a little bit overweight to equities. Um, but I would say that leaning into risk doesn't mean reaching for risky assets, right? So I, I think that the macro outlook is better than we expected coming into the year, certainly. Um, there still seems to be strong growth momentum by, behind the U.S. economy, even if it is slowing. Um, it feels like that's slowing down um, from a, a pretty breakneck pace feels fairly benign in terms of how it's happening. So, you know, our, our view and how that translates over to monetary policy um, and, and portfolio implications for that is, you know, with the, the encouraging CPI print that we got, you know, in terms of, of a real disinflation, you know, narrative kind of coming true, is we do think that that's going to allow the Fed to cut rates. Our expectation is that they're going to cut twice this year. So, so we're kind of calling for a September cut and then a pause and then a cut again in December. Um, so again, all very encouraging in terms of that soft landing narrative. Um, it does feel as though we've taken out a lot of that left tail in terms of recession risk this year. Um, I know it seems like that was a long time ago, but even just as of December, you know, everybody was expecting we were going to be in a recession this year. The question was just whether it was going to be in the first half or the second half of the year. Um, so we've, we've, we've moved along in a much more positive direction from, from that prognosis. Um, and 2024 should be up much better than expected. But even so, I think the cautious part of our optimism here comes from the fact that even after two rate, rate cuts, we still expect that monetary policy is going to be restrictive. Um, so maybe it's not quite as high. Maybe it's not quite as long um, as, you know, kind of some of the narrative was um, earlier in, in terms of interest rates staying high, but you know, two cuts is 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 still going to leave us in restrictive territory. So I think the important implication for that and for our macro outlook is that we do still like being a bit up in quality. Um, so we've still really been talking about QUAL. Um, we really like some of those companies across sectors. This isn't just a sector play, um, but the companies that have the uh, highest profitability. Um, that have the most earnings stability over time. And then really importantly, the companies that have the strongest balance sheet and the lowest leverage, because again, even though interest rates are coming down, they still look restrictive to us. 
Right. Uh, so after the rally, the blockbuster rally in the first half, the biggest question for investors now is whether the uptrend can continue in the second half. And in the first half, the rally was very, very narrow and it narrowed further in the second quarter with NVIDIA, Apple and Microsoft driving more than 90% of the market gains. Then Lately, we have seen some broadening of the rally and this week in particular, and for reference, uh, we are recording this on Thursday, July 18th. Uh, so this week, investors have sold this, this year's winners, particularly the Magnificent Seven, and they have piled into small caps and other attractively valued areas. And today in particular, we have seen a sell-off in small caps as well. Everything is down. So let's talk a little bit more about your stock market outlook for the second half and which areas in particular do you think are poised to do well uh, in the back half of this year? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is kind of the most important question right now and and very much um, a, a moving target in terms of what is up and down um, over the last week or two. So I, I guess, you know, starting with the first part is we do still think that the second half can be a positive year for equities. I don't think we expect that it's going to be symmetrical um, in any way and that, you know, we're going to get the same magnitude of rally in the second half as we as we got in the first half. And it probably also isn't going to have the same complexion um, of what the first half specifically did. So, I mean, I, I, I do think, you know, kind of going back to that idea that we still like quality and frankly, you know, there's been a high degree of overlap between quality and the AI trade. Um, so, so cognizant of that and how much further it can go. But I will say one thing that encourages us is that, you know, even though I'll, I'll, use, I'll use kind of round numbers here and I'm, I'm giving the, the market a little bit more credit than it's actually reserved, but call it, you know, up 20% in the, the first half. What we've seen, though, is that valuations from January to July have really stayed about the same. And the reason is because earnings have really come in and justified those higher prices because there was more earnings growth than was expected. Um, NVIDIA trades cheaper now than it did a year ago um, on a forward earnings basis. So, it, it, you know, I, I think the, the first part of this conversation is that, you know, we don't necessarily think that this is a, a bubble forming. Um, again, we, you know, we, we think that the market has, has correctly sort of rewarded the companies and the complexes where the earnings growth has come from. And that has been large cap, mega cap growth quality names. Going forward, and as we reprice expectations, um, given again, sort of the encouraging inflation narrative that we've seen, um, giving rate cuts being priced back into the market rather than just out of the market this year. I do think that there's room to add other things to, to the portfolio. So if we like quality at the core, we're starting to look at some of those peripheral um, investments and, and kind of what makes sense in the specific environment. So yes, small cap has rallied very, very sharply um, in the last five to 10 days here. Again, on a lot of metrics, it's almost unprecedented, um, the outperformance of small cap relative to large cap. We're not totally surprised to see that, even though we weren't calling and we bore and we don't love small caps right now. And the reason behind that is because small cap rallies, when they happen, they tend to be fairly sharp and violent, but also fairly short. Um, and so a lot of what we've seen over the last week or so looks to us more like positioning changes. Um, there, A lot of it felt sort of um, short squeeze driven. A lot of it was derivative led rather than cash equities. Um, and so, you know, it feels more positioning than it does a wholesale change of a of an investment or a fundamental outlook. So even though we've seen this really sharp performance, we would advise people against, um, you know, too quickly jumping in to chase this rally because these things do tend to reverse. So, again, you know, I, I think we, we think that the, the market can broaden out. And so growth and performance can come from other names other than the ones that you mentioned that have driven so much of, of the first half. But we're being pretty selective about where we see that opportunity. So I think there's kind of select parts um, of the, the value factor and value style that we like. 
Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about a lot too is just that this may be in an environment that is unusually rich for active management because we think we're going to see a fair amount of inflection points this year. So something like DYNF, which is our dynamic factor allocation ETF, um, that, you know, it looks a lot like quality right now because it, you know, the, the signals and the active management within it are still suggesting that that's the right trade, but it can move really quickly. Um, if we do think that we're going to see more of a durable rotation from growth to value, for example, or from large and mega cap to small cap. But I think, you know, from our, our kind of fundamental perspective, we need to see earnings come in strong before we're necessarily buying into the, the lower quality rally. Now, this week in particular, we have seen a surge in market volatility because now we have election policy related uh, election related policy uncertainties in addition to macroeconomic and other geopolitical uncertainties and yesterday chip stocks particularly ai darling nvidia and ts and they plunged after trump said that Taiwan should pay for its own defense and also Biden administration. There were reports that they were they are considering tougher restrictions on trading chips with China. Uh, so we will see these kind of headlines as we approach the election. How can investors position their portfolios for these uh, election related uncertainties? Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll say this is one of the most common questions, you know, we get when we're out speaking to investors, you know, all over is, is how should I think about the election and my portfolio? And I think that the highest level takeaway that we have in the most important one is really just underscoring the importance of staying invested even throughout the volatility, right? So, so just the simple binary. Um, of staying in the market. We have done a lot of research and analysis on this um, and, and sort of parsed the data and looked at, you know, how markets perform under different regimes. And the short answer is that markets, you know, over the long term do their thing um, and they go up again over the long term, um, irrespective of which party holds power. So I think that's kind of the, the top line takeaway to, to remember. And then for investors who do want to maybe trade tactically around this, where we're really focusing right now is trying to identify areas of overlap um, and areas of commonality that are, are going to stay true, again, regardless of what happens in November. And some of those areas and, and, and pockets of opportunity that we like, um, they have a couple different themes to them. So one, I'll give you an example that I think is a really unique offering that we have, um, IETC. It's our, our U.S. Tech Independence Fund. Um, I think this one is really interesting because it, it directly invests in um, and, and looks to benefit from the global sort of reshoring and deglobalization trend that we see playing out. So if we think about tech independence as being sort of a, you know, the, the new arms race, if you will, of the 21st century, what this one does is try to identify companies that are benefiting from, from onshoring, um, from, from kind of bringing things back um, to America. We launched a fund just today um, called Made that is made in America. So really focusing on American manufacturing. I think those are two really interesting areas where both parties are aligned. And then also just, um, you know, moving to kind of from a sectoral view, if you will, we see opportunity in things like utilities and infrastructure. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter who, you know, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat in the White House, we need roads and we need bridges. And I would also add to that that, you know, given how AI is playing out in the massive, massive energy demands that that has and the need for new data centers, um, even a, a sector that may have historically been pretty unsexy, like utilities, it, you know, we, we kind of think that that can be part of the next wave of AI investing. So moving beyond just sort of technology and the hyperscalers and the semiconductors, um, but moving into the some of the, the physical needs um, to develop the technology and the power needs behind um, how it, you know, the, the second wave of, of AI playing out. So definitely some areas for commonality. I think there's some different ways to play that. Um, but, but yeah, those are the conversations we're having with investors right now. 
Yeah, I saw Maid. Uh, so congratulations on the launch. It's a very interesting ETF and yeah. IEDC as well. And I agree with you, boosting dom domestic manufacturing. That is one of the very, very few areas that the two parties agree on. <laughs> and uh, I like your um, uh, comments about staying invested, the advice that you're giving to clients, uh, because it's best for long term focused investors to in ignore all these uh, noise <laughs> in between because stocks tend to go up over the longer term. So it's just stay invested. And once we get better clarity on uh, on the election out outcome, then that would be good for the market um, yeah. again. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about AI because AI has dramatically transformed the investment landscape and uh, companies which are focused on AI, they saw triple digit returns and unprecedented earnings growth as well. You, you talked about NVIDIA, how it is trading now at a cheaper forward earnings ratio because earnings have gone up even faster than its uh, price of appreciation. But uh, after this initial hype and the recent sell-off in many popular AI stocks, uh, investors are now kind of becoming more discerning and they are trying to distinguish genuine uh, beneficiaries of the AI trend from the rest. And we have also seen some concerns that these substantial tens of billions of dollars tech giants, uh, they are investing on AI infrastructure. They That could far exceed the potential returns. Uh, so I was interested in your thoughts and you talked a little bit about how investors can capitalize on the opportunities that arise from the transformative power of AI. Uh, so tell us why you think AI can remain a dominant investment theme in the second half. And could you also talk a little bit more about the areas that are likely to benefit now? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I think you're exactly right. You know, we we do remain convicted that AI is not just hype. Um, and, and so we do see on the horizon um, that there are going to be myriad use cases, many of which we probably can't even imagine right now. Um, but, I, but that said, I, I think we have to talk about it not just in sort of the philosophical sense, um, but probably in the investment one. And, and some of that in, it depends on kind of the investment horizon. But where we are right now, you know, we kind of still call the picks and shovels stage. Um, so, so we're, you know, in, in terms of the, the near term investment opportunities, we're still looking at some of the AI enablers as opposed to trying to identify companies that are specifically going to benefit from the productivity enhancements that AI enables. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do think those are two, two separate things and two separate investment theses. And I understand the pushback um, that, that, you know, we, get, we and others get about trying to identify the companies that will benefit from AI. It still feels like that is, um, it, it's early days. There will be winners and losers, but there is not a ton of clarity in terms of exactly who that's going to be. Um, but that said, that doesn't mean that it's not an investable theme right now. I think we saw phase one, as, as we've mentioned, in terms of the hardware, the semiconductors, um, some of the, the hyperscalers behind that and the, the large language models and, um, and, and just really the companies with the amount of data have benefited so far. It is that next wave of investing that we think is, is probably a bit more physical in, in terms of sort of the infrastructure that's needed to get us to the next stage. So, you know, another very important thing to keep in mind with, with all technological advances is that they don't happen in a straight line. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, it makes sense to us that we're seeing a little bit of a breather in terms of stage one AI beneficiaries, given the tremendous run that they've had already. Um, so not surprised to see, see profit taking there um, and really just trying to pivot and be a little bit forward looking and think about what might come next. So I think that's that's the the important part of the conversation. It's what comes next, but not what's over the hill and on the other side of the horizon because we just can't know that part yet. Um, so so yeah, focusing again a little more on the utilities and the infrastructure, and we'll eventually get there. But we do believe that we will in terms of um, the productivity enhancements as well. 
Right. Now, another trend that we have seen within the ETF world is rise in active ETFs. They have become so popular. They are becoming, they are becoming so popular with the investors. And we have seen some very interesting actively managed ETFs launch as well. And uh, I saw a recent note by BlackRock, uh, which projects that global active AUM will surge to $4 trillion by 2030. And that's more than fourfold increase in six years. So tell us a little bit about this note and what are the reasons behind this surge in popularity of actively managed strategies? <laughs> yeah, we certainly made some headlines with that. It's a pretty bold prediction. Um, but you know, based upon the recent trajectory and the growth rates that we have seen, um, we feel pretty comfortable making it. So yeah, it's it's a big Big number, $4 trillion uh, in, in active ETFs by 2030. We think it's going to be driven by a, a couple of different things. Um, and, and we can also talk a little bit about the types of active funds that are on offer, because I think those have evolved as well. I, you know, One reason that I would point to why we think that these are growing so quickly is because of their adoption in the model manager space. So because so many of the, the large models you know, which historically have, have, you know, maybe used mostly ETFs or a combination of ETFs and mutual funds. Um, you know, what we've seen is that they're increasingly asking us for and they are increasingly um, looking for active strategies to pair alongside index funds. Um, so our, our own target allocation models um, are, are some of the biggest, if not the biggest in the model space um, with over kind of a hundred billion dollars worth of assets that are tracking them. Uh, and, and again, there it's a really interesting mix. Um, the, the portfolio manager looks for great opportunities. They are somewhat constrained by how frequently, how frequently they rebalance. So some of the value add that they find in adding active ETFs to their models is that those can respond more quickly to changing economic environments than sometimes the model managers themselves can, right? Um, and so I, I think that there's a really interesting use case to be made there for kind of the combination of index and active. In terms of the types of funds that we see being launched, um, there's the traditional real, you know, what we, you probably think of when you think of active, of, of alpha-seeking, alpha um, stock, bond selection, you know, single name types of things, and, and a whole wide variety of, of everything in between. So there's Quant funds, there's fundamental funds, there's true alpha seeking. Where we've seen a lot of growth recently is also in what we call the outcome oriented funds. So some that, you know, may use options to enhance income, for example, or some of the buffered products. So I think there's just so many different flavors of active ETF that they can solve a, a variety of different portfolio challenges, whether it's diversification or, or dampening volatility. Or really just truly seeking to outperform or, or, you know, just being able to respond more quickly to market moves than most managers can. And I think that's what underscores our belief that they can grow as, as quickly as we expect them to. Very interesting. Now, switching gears a little bit, I wanted to talk about ETF flows as well. And uh, it was a great first step for ETF and flows. Investors put about $420 billion dollars into U.S. ETFs in the first half. And uh, with that, we are on track for the second best year of ETF flows. And if the stock market rally continues in the second half, this could be the best year ever, right? I, I think we have a chance of hitting $1 trillion uh, in ETF inflows. So I know that you track ETF flows very, very closely. So I was interested in your thoughts also. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll we'll uh, keep our fingers crossed for that new record. You know, we're always hoping for that. But but yeah, you, you know, it was exactly as you mentioned. I think that the strong performance of the equity market, and and probably even there's some element of strong unexpected performance of the equity markets this year have driven a lot of that. So investors who maybe were a little bit more cautious, a little more risk off in late 2023 have been allocating pretty quickly to uh, to equity ETFs to play catch up. So I do think that investors were maybe, you know, had under-owned some of the U.S. equity markets that have performed so well. And so we, we really did see a bit of a reallocation. 
you know, we've talked a lot about the record six trillion dollars of cash on the sidelines um, as, as measured in kind of money market asset ma- assets under management right now. So some of that rotation away from cash and in you know back into risk assets has started. We think that as the Fed actually starts cutting rates and and you know you can no longer earn five percent just hiding out in cash anymore, we're going to see even more of that. So you know I, I think at the very top level you know, very strong flows. And and that makes sense to us. The complexion of those flows um, is interesting and and really very heavily skewed towards growth and technology um, to the point where those are are probably a bit stretched in terms of positioning. So again, kind of what mirrors what I was talking about in, in terms of what we expect we could see in performance changing a bit over the second half of the year. I would be surprised if we didn't also see more flows into value funds, for example, or value sectors to address an underweight that we think a lot of investors have there right now. Excellent stuff, Christy. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your insights. Of course, it was a great conversation. Thanks for having me back. That was Christy Akulian of BlackRock. Now, let's recap some of the ETF tickers that we talked about For quality, she mentioned the MSCI USA Quality Factor ETF. The ticker symbol is QUAL, Q-U-A-L. And for the active management strategies, uh, we talked about Equity Factor Rotation ETF. The ticker symbol is D-Y-N-F. This ETF has seen a lot of interest from investors this year and a lot of inflows as well. And uh, for the reshoring, onshoring theme, boosting American manufacturing, uh, we talked about two ETFs, the U.S. Tech Independence ETF, the ticker symbol is IETC, and the new ETF, which just made its debut today, it's the U.S. Manufacturing ETF, ticker symbol is MADE, M-A-D-E, easy to remember. And uh, for AI theme, uh, we talked about investing in picks and shovel, the ch- semiconductor stocks. Uh, the, so the popular ETF there is SOXX, the iShares Semiconductor ETF. And she also talked about utilities, uh, how they are uh, those stocks uh, will benefit from the surge in data center power needs. So the iShares US Utilities ETF is IDU. And in full disclosure, I own SOXX and Qual in the ETF investor portfolio that I manage. Thanks for listening. If you like our show, please leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, please email podcast at sax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identify and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.